So as Susan mentioned, I've spent most of the past uh, five years in her lab working on the wild ancestor of cultivated Asian rice, that's Oryza pogon. And um, my presentation today will focus on what still are sort of very preliminary results coming up on um, genetic diversity and GWAS with the wild ancestor. I remember another um, former grad student in Susan's lab was telling me that results only come in the last like six months of your thesis, and I'm really finding that to be true now. So I just wanted to point out that in this title slide, um, I went to China two years ago to do a field evaluation of the wild rice in China and um, was really lucky to have that opportunity because we cannot grow this wild ancestor um, in the US or really in any of the other um, Asian countries we have collaborators in because of um, agricultural restrictions where they don't want the wild um, traits introgressing or um, cross-pollinating into cultivated Oryza sativa. So really lucky to work with um, my host, Professor Go Song, um, Dr. Chen, and the graduate student I was working closely with, Liu Rong. So um, really, I think my PhD has been unique for a number of different reasons. But in relation to the wilds, I think especially so because in our department, if you are working on a wild ancestor, maybe you're only looking at it from a basic um, genetics or genetic diversity population structure related perspective or from a very applied um, breeding perspective. What can I introgress from this wild ancestor into um, my cultivated species? And what I've had the um, luck to be able to do is to sort of work at that intersection of those two very sort of um, basic genetics and a sort of more applied component. So I'll give a brief introduction to um, Ariza, both the cultivated species and the wild ancestor and wild relatives. Um, talk about our work um, that, I, that I've done with Hyun Jung Kim and with others in the lab, looking at um, characterizing the wild at genetic diversity and population structure. And thoughts for um, what we might think of, uh, of this wild ancestor after I've talked maybe more about what we've discovered about population structure in terms of thinking about how to possibly reclassify this ancestor complex. Then I'm going to switch gears and talk about the more applied side, looking at um, doing geno a genome-wide association study with both um, Arisa sativa, but also with this wild ancestor, Rufopogon, and specifically pull out an example from aluminum tolerance work that I've done in concert with Juan David, another graduate student in our lab. So just a quick overview of the Ariza genus. Uh, it consists of 23 different species, both diploids and tetraploids. And there's something like 10 or 11 different genomes. But this is just a sampling of the different um, Ariza species. And you can see really the differences in, huge differences in morphology in um, plant height, in flowering, represented across this genus. And our primary species complex that we're looking at containing the cultivated um, species is the AA genome. So that's represented up here. Um, we have two cultivated rice species, the Asian cultivated rice, Oryza sativa, and the African, Oryza glabarima. We're focusing on um, the Asian species, Oryza sativa. And so that has, it's been um, cultivated, domesticated, is a semi-annual. 
um, low outcrossing rate, highly self-pollinating, and it's really um, been bred to be able to grow in a wide range of different environments from rain-fed upland to irrigated paddies. Um, what we're seeing in the direct ancestors are uh, two different, what's been called species, Arisa nivara, which is uh, the annual type. It's 20% outcrossing, and it's found in these seasonally wet environments, so like riverbanks or um, sh lake shores where during the monsoon season or during the wet season, they'll be, um, these plants will be inundated, but during the rest of the year, they'll be growing in pretty much dry, dry land. Um, the sister species is a perennial, um, much higher outcrossing rate, and it's found really in aquatic environments. So um, in sort of the lake centers or stream beds where uh, it's predominantly always in a wet aquatic submerged environment. And so one of the major differences we're seeing between these two so-called species is that not only is there a um, annual and perennial difference, but the Navarra reproduces mostly by seed, and Rufopogon tends to reproduce, oops, more clonally um, through through nodes that develop um, roots when submerged in water, and then these the stems or the stolons that these roots are developing from can break off and start a new clone or a ramet. And one thing very important I should point out um, with the, this A genome complex is that they're all intermatable um, to some certain degree. So although there is um, genetic diversity between all of them, um, really we'll be digging into um, population structure and genetic diversity of the wilds in looking at um, its ancestral uh, relationship to the cultivated species. And I just wanted to point out here that the Ariza nivara, the annual, um, and Ariza rufopogon share a um, current geographic range, and that's South and Southeast Asia. Navarra is um, predominantly in continental South and Southeast Asia, whereas Rufopogon extends from the continental side through the um, oceanic or archipelago um, Southeast Asia. And these two stars represent the center of domestication for Ariza sativa. So you can see that um, for Japonica, this is in the Yangtze River Valley about 10,000 years ago, and it's at the very edge of the um, northern, current northern range. And so uh, the gene pool here was really bottlenecked, um, really much lower in diversity than the, another domestication event for the indica um, subspecies, and that was um, near the Ganges. And right within um, both the range of Navarra and the range of Rufopogon, so much more genetically diverse. Oops. So, some of the main questions I want to ask here are really what is this O. rufopogon complex that consists both of Ariza rufopogon um, perennial and Ariza, rufopo uh, Ariza nivara, the annual form? Can rufopogon be morphologically differentiated from nivara? Can it be genetically differentiated? And does this O. rufopogon complex show any phylogeographic 
differentiation. So let's look at morphological differentiation first. In Horizon Devara versus Horizon Rufa Pogon, um, when I went to China two years ago, it was really to study the differences between these two groups. So Susan and I um, decided that we really wanted to work with Dr. Ge Song, who is with the Chinese Academy of Science and who is um, a world expert in being able to differentiate these two groups. So when I went there, I went to his lab and had a discussion with him and his students and discovered that they're really only using um, eight or nine gross morphological or developmental traits to differentiate these two. So um, a suite of vegetative traits, some reproductive traits, and some traits rel related to um, development, heading day, and absence or presence of these um, creeping stems, which they see as unique only to um, Arise of Pogon. So I should point out that a lot of these traits also are, um, at least the reproductive traits, have a lot to do with the life habit um, of the two in terms of reproductive traits being more closely affiliated with a um, self-pollinating, seed-producing um, annual habit of Arisa nivara versus the outcrossing um, vegetatively or clonally reproductive um, perennial life habit of Arisa rufipogon. In our lab, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in looking at these two groups, or these two, sorry, um, these two species, how do we tell them apart? Or what do we see when we um, grow them out? So if you took those eight or nine different traits that I just showed, combined them into some sort of multivariate trait estimate along the y-axis here, <laughs> ancestrally, we can presume that um, there were pools of individuals or pools of populations across the geographic range that exhibit a continuous range of morphologies between the two. What we see today, um, and there really are two schools of thought associated with thinking about um, this wild ancestor complex, so what one school of thought is seeing is that there is some morphological distinction between um, an annual form and a perennial form. But there is a wide number of accessions, at least characterized from the publicly available accessions in gene banks that are morphologically intermediate. And what another class of researchers see, including um, Dr. Go, who I worked closely with in China, is that they already have um, absolutely defined uh, sort of canonical definitions of species that they use to um, inform their view of what a particular plant or what a particular population is, such that uh, a plant or a population, depending on its suite of traits, is either Navarra-like or Rufipogon-like. If it is something in between, then it's not considered a wild ancestor. It's not considered either Navarra or Rufipogon. Another complication is that we also see traits, um, domestication-related traits associated with Arisa sativa, the cultivated species, in here. So these are traits like 
um, the absence of on of an on the long um, whisker or tail on the seed, uh, white hull or white seed coat, and this is not to suggest that Arisa sativa is sort of intermediate between the two, but that we do occasionally see um, some sometimes some of these domestication or sativa-like traits popping up in the accessions that we're looking at. That's never really been a huge issue to um, groups like our lab, where we are seeing a large range of uh, morphotypes that are difficult to distinguish from each other. <laughs> but when um, labs that define the wild according to either a canonical Navara morphotype or canonical roof pogon morphotype see that um, they just throw those out as well as being hybrids. Um, so what conclusions can we come to in terms of whether we can differentiate the two morphologically? Really, at this point in time, I think we can only say that there exists something of a continuous range in morphology. Maybe there, um, there's some differentiation that we see between annual and perennial type or seed producing and clonally reproductive types, but really separate distinct groups are unresolvable by morphology or morphotype. So can Arisa rufopogon uh, be g genetically differentiated from Navarro if it can't be morphologically differentiated? So when we do um, a structure analysis, and I should preface this by saying that a lot of this work, um, at least the genotyping was done by many of our past lab members and structure analysis was uh, carried out with or by Hyun Jung Kim, um, another grad student in our lab that I've been working closely with. So if we look at st structure analysis of um, some, I think it's 180 wilds um, that were <coughs> genotyped using SSRs, using signs, and using mite markers, so we see at k equals two, of course, two different groups. Do these groups correlate with what um, our accessions have been characterized as in terms of either um, Rufopogon or Navara? We see that this purple group is actually 100% Rufopogon. However, we see that this second black um, cluster is not um, completely Navara, but contains some 70% Rufopogon, some 15% Navara, and um, a range of other sort of hybrid species designations. So what we're seeing here is that um, really the two species don't hold up as genetically distinct um, species. If we go to k equals three and divide our panel into three different groups, we see even more confusion. Um, the purple cluster of 100% roof of Pogon pretty much stays constant, but you have a green cluster on the other end coming out, and that is um, also showing sort of an admixture of different species classifications, where you can't really say it's one or the other. And if you look at k equals four, which is actually what was shown through delta k values to be the most significant number of populations in our panel, we have four different, um, 
four different clusters. The purple cluster of 100% roof of Pogon remains the same. Much of the green um, remains the same also. But this third um, black subpopulation gets divided almost in half. Um, and this third bl or fourth blue cluster comes out. And that, of course, I didn't put up um, species classification percentages, but it is even um, sort of more confused than k equals 3. So Rufopogon really cannot be morphologically differentiated from Novara, neither can they be genetically differentiated. But does this complex of Rufopogon and Novara show any sort of phylogeographic differentiation? So um, differentiation genetically that is across some sort of geographic cline. And we see actually that at k equals four, um, even though that we even though we have these this purple and this green uh, subpopulations, they really are not just uh, genetically sort of distinct or identical, but they also cluster together geographically. So, a hundred percent of the Papua New Guinea accessions in our panel um, are represented in this purple cluster, whereas 100% of the accessions from Nepal are represented in the green cluster, plus um, about a quarter of the Indian accessions. And looking at this mostly blue but somewhat admixed um, group here, all the Taiwanese, all four Taiwanese accessions are clustering in this blue um, subpopulation, plus 40% of um, the Chinese accessions. So if we look at that on a map where uh, the colors of the dots represent the accessions color-coded according to um, our k equals four clusters with the brown actually being admixed. So anything below 50% um, genetic identity with a particular cluster is considered admixed. We actually see, um, so a, uh, I guess, an east-west differentiation between the green Indian and Nepal group um, and the Papua New Guinea group in the very eastern end of the range. And also a north-south differentiation between these blue, um, this blue cluster, which is mostly in Taiwan and in China. And then um, the black, predominantly black uh, subpopulation, which is mainly below um, the range or the line of the blue. If we superimpose the two ranges of Navara and Rufopogon, we can see here that um, as expected, in the allopatric range of Rufopogon, there is genetic distinction at this very eastern end here. And this is significant, not just because this exists, but because we know um, from the geographic history, um, way back in the Holocene, when there were, well, in the Pleistocene before that, when this whole area was sort of, um, 
when the Earth was in a glacial stage, this archipelago area was actually connected by a land bridge. And then um, thousands of years later, there was a warming um, wetter period in the transition to the Holocene. Sea levels rose, temperature rose, and the land bridge disappeared. So populations here were cut off. Um, and what we're seeing interestingly now is not just that we have the sort of this purple Papua New Guinea specific subpopulation, but also this green subpopulation here appears to be um, within the range of Arisa Navara. And really, um, the black seems to be throughout the sympatric range of Ariza Navara and Rufopogon. And as we might expect, we see admix accessions mostly in this continental um, Southeast Asia area. So can Ariza Rufopogon be morphologically or genetically differentiated? No, not really clearly. But it do, does show some phylogeographic differentiation according to a north-south gradient and a east-west gradient. Why is this important, really? Why are we studying um, the wilds? And how can we relate it back to plant breeding, which is the main thrust of this department? We can ask questions like, does the genetic diversity and the evolutionary history of this wild ancestor um, allow it to retain sort of some evolutionary flexibility in life habit in the face of climate change, which is uh, very important, as we all know, today in um, people's plant breeding programs. So, do we really see evidence that this O. rufopogon complex <laughs> retains ev evolutionary flexibility? So do we see um, sort of a range of um, variation that can come out from what looks like a more or less continuous um, genetic or morphological um, cluster or, or um, continuous group. And indeed, if we look, look at how um, the subpopulations are structured by country, um, and these are roughly laid out so that um, this is the west of the range and this is the eastern end with China and Taiwan, we see that indeed um, there is sort of a, a range of genetic diversity exist in all of these different sort of um, semi-artificial country-related groupings of accessions, where there is not only admixture in um, most of these countries, but um, there are there's really a whole range of four subpopulations in almost every country, um, except maybe for Papua New Guinea and for the accessions in, in Nepal. So we can say that there is maybe some, some genetic, um, maybe not evidence, but uh, some genetic support that or the rise of Rufopogon complex can retain some evolutionary flexibility in the form of genetic diversity um, that may allow it to, say, switch back between annual and perennial types um, 
when looking at issues of climate change, not only from the current perspective, but also from the evolutionary perspective um, many thousands of years ago. We can ask now, does the Horizon of Polygon complex contain novel variation for our traits of interest? And has what we've just um, discovered about the subpopulation structure provide some sort of blueprint for identifying useful variation um, in this wild ancestor for use in breeding programs with um, cultivated rice. So I'm going to switch now to the second part of my talk and talk about our work um, using both Oriza Sativa and Oriza Rufopogon diversity panels to study transgressive, transgressive variation um, in cultivated rice and this wild ancestor. So this is a big um, collaborative project in Susan's lab with um, many institutions. The major collaborators are the Dale Bumpers National Rice Research Center um, in Stuttgart, Arkansas, and also the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And together, what we've done is composed a panel of 1900 Arisa sativa varieties that include not only some ancestral accessions, but also land races and modern varieties, and a panel of geographically, genetically, and morphologically diverse Arisa river pogon, which I had um, chosen from the previous panel of 180 lines that we had genotyped. And admittedly, although these are genetically and morphologically and geographically diverse, we selected for seed producers so we had enough seed of these accessions to do our phenotypic screens. And that has limited um, our germplasm representation so that, for instance, the Papua New Guinea group, which is mostly clonally or vegetatively reproductive, um, is not really represented in our panel at all. So over the past five years, I've, I and a number of um, my colleagues and collaborators in the lab have been involved in uh, doing phenotypic evaluation, not just on the sativas, but at least for my part, on this panel of, of 100 or 95 Arisa Rufa Pogon lines to look at um, morphologically and reproductively developmentally different traits. Um, we've collaborated with Leon Cochin's lab in the USDA and his former student, Randy Clark, who's now working at Pioneer to, do, to look at 3D root system architecture. Um, we've also looked at seedling vigor and done an aluminum tolerance screen, which I'll get more into, um, that I've collaborated with Juan David, um, another grad student in the McCooch lab on. And then also, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, we were able to phenotype our, or a subset of our panel for life habit traits, so traits associated with annuality, perenniality, um, seed production versus clonal produ uh, reproduction in the field in China. So coming off of the phenotypic screens we've done, we can ask these questions about whether the Arisa or Rufopogon complex contains novel um, variation for the traits of interest and whether what we know about subpopulation structure ha helps to provide sort of a blueprint or a map for identifying useful variation in, um, in our wild germplasm. So looking at how the, the cultivated um, Arisa sativa and uh, this Arisa rufopogon complex grouped together genetically, we can see that um, in Arisa sativa, there are five different, um, five different subpopulations. Really, uh, the, where's my, 
winter. The tropical temperate and aromatic subpopulations, which together constitute the Japonica subspecies, and the Indica and Alsh subpopulations, which constitute the Indica subspecies. And from um, the Arisa roof of Pogon, and this is all I should say, uh, data from the resequencing of 125 different sativa, rufopogon, and um, these African cultivated rice and its wild ancestor. We see that um, Arisa rufopogon, which, is, which are these black um, colored accessions here, cluster mostly with Alsh indica, and there are sort of very few in between representing um, maybe Japonica-like ancestors. But we really see um, very divergent subpopulation structure in the Sativas and much less so in the Rufa Pogon complex. So getting back to aluminum tolerance in rice, why is this important? Um, 50% of the potentially arable agricultural land in the world is acidic. And aluminum is the third major element in the Earth's crust. That becomes a problem um, under acid soil conditions where the aluminum is solubilized into a phytotoxic form. And um, at least interestingly enough for rice, this is not a problem under flooded or irrigated conditions where rice is grown in a paddy system, but um, is more of a problem for, for rice or for crops that are grown in um, dry land rain fed agriculture. So it's odd to see that even though um, a lot of the rice, cultivated rice today, is grown under irrigated systems. And um, cultivated rice was domesticated from an aquatic, aquatic or seasonally, um, seasonally wet populations of, in the Navarra um, Rupa Pogon complex, that rice actually tolerates a much, much higher concentration of um, soil alum aluminum than the other major cereals, um, either maize, wheat, or sorghum, even though it hasn't really um, sort of needed to develop this natural tolerance for um, aluminum on its own, growing under flooded or wet conditions. So we conducted an aluminum tolerance screen on a subset of 68 Rufa Pogon lines. Um, and this was done with both Juan David and myself working together to um, analyze these lines using a screening and analysis platform developed by Adam Famoso, a former student in our lab, and um, Randy Clark, former student in Leon Cochin's lab. So we basically looked at the 68 Rufa Pogon lines to Sativa witness lines um, and did 10 reps, 10 ceilings of each accession in either a 160 micromolar aluminum um, hydroponic solution or a zero micromolar aluminum solution. And then um, took images of these seedlings at 5, 10, and 13 days past transplanting into solution. And thanks to the screening and analysis, or the imaging and analysis platform developed by Randy Clark, um, we're able to semi-automatically -auto extract the root trait measurements from photographs using Root Reader 2, 2D software that Randy developed. What we see when we compare Adam's results on aluminum tolerance in Arisa sativa to results um, 
that Juan David and I have gotten from our screen of Arisa Rufopogon are that at least in Sativa, we see that subpopulation structure really accounts for a large amount of um, the degree of phenotypic variation for aluminum tolerance. So 57% uh, of variation for aluminum tolerance is explained by subpopulation in Arisa Sativa because um, japonica accessions are two times more tolerant than indica. In Arisa rufopogon, that's quite different. We see um, a much smaller variation in um, aluminum tolerance, and this is aluminum tolerance as measured by relative root growth, which is basically the ratio of growth in um, 160 micromolar aluminum solution to the ratio of root growth or total root length in um, zero micromolar control solution. So in Arisa rufopogon, we see only 11% of the phenotypic variation is explained by our new um, subpopulation designations. One interesting question that we can now ask um, with our wild, wild panel screening for aluminum tolerance is whether um, we've seen now a phylog phylogeographic separation of this Arisa rufopogon complex. Does that correlate with aluminum tolerance in, these, um, in this wild complex such that in um, India and Bangladesh where you have um, where aluminum toxicity is not a problem do you see um, a difference in aluminum toxicity between accessions that are native to to this area versus accessions that are native to um, the southeast and east Asian um, area where they are being grown on highly aluminum toxic soils. So what we see when we look at um, phenotypic variation explained by geographic region is that there is a slight, um, a slight level of significant phenotypic variation that is explained by um, geographic region in Arisa rufopogon. Some 18% of phenotypic variation is explained by um, geographic region. And here you can see on the, in the bottom that accessions from West Asia, um, which is basically India, um, Bangladesh, Nepal, those areas of the world that had um, no aluminum toxicity uh, problems were much less aluminum tolerant, as one might expect, not being under selective pressure than um, accessions from the eastern range of the Arisa rufopogon complex. What we're seeing, and these are very sort of preliminary results that have just been generated, um, what we're seeing as far as um, GWAS results are that we actually do, despite the small size of our panel, see um, many significant peaks, at least for um, our relative root length day average, which is an average of the um, 5, 10, and 13 day time points. So even at a threshold of um, a log p-value of 4, we see you know, 10 to 12 different possible peaks that could be um, potential 
that could um, could contain sort of genes that encode for aluminum tolerance in this wild panel. I'm only going to be looking at um, two different peaks in the um, sort of very constrained time I've had to analyze these results so far. But looking at this very high peak on chromosome one and an another um, almost equally as high, very well supported peak on chromosome 10, what do we do now um, to look at candidate genes that may be underlying these peaks? So I've taken a two-pronged analysis and done both an a priori um, and a um, approach for looking at the uh, the rice genes that have already been cloned and characterized and are associated with aluminum tolerance. But of these 48 genes, none were found to fall within a um, 100 kb region flanking the peak pick snip of those two different um, peaks on chromosome 1 and 10. So what I did was sort of a, um, a posteriori approach which was to look at those 100 KB regions and to determine what MSU annotated loci had been um, mapped to those regions surrounding that peak pick snip. And so what I found were um, 14 annotated loci in chromosome one, 12 of which were annotated as being <coughs> either ESTs or full length cDNAs. <coughs> And on chromosome 10, 10 annotated loci, five of which were also annotated as being um, either ESTs or full length cDNAs. And really quickly, um, I've just highlighted some possible genes from those two different regions that may be um, candidate genes to look into. So going back to our sort of um, walkthrough of the importance of this wild ancestor in plant breeding, we can say that yes, Ariza rufopogon at least seems to contain some novel variation for our traits of interest. And as to whether subpopulation structure provides a blueprint for identifying useful variation, maybe not so much in aluminum um, with aluminum tolerance, but looking at the different other traits, especially the morphological traits that have to do with reproduction, with life habit. Um, it may be that subpopulation structure um, may provide more information in identifying useful variation within these wild accessions. So as far as our, as our conclusions to date on Rufopogon, what is it? Um, it's really something that we still don't know how to differentiate. It cannot be differentiated morphologically or genetically into the two different canonically defined um, species. Instead, genetically, we're showing um, subpopulation structure significant at k equals four, so four different subpopulations, which do show some phylogeographic differentiation, um, either clustering at the eastern and western range of the complex or across a north to south cline. And we see that genetic diversity across this range um, hints at some level of evolutionary plasticity. Likely, Ruf this Rufopogon complex is a source of novel allelic variation for important agronomic traits, and we're going to need to do our analyses, our um, GWAS, on all of the other um, different morphological and developmental traits that we've screened this panel for. 
but we know that geography and subpopulation may hint at how to access um, phenotypic variation for breeding purposes with Oryza sativa. So really, our, my next steps, um, or our next steps in our lab will be to really think about and discuss this recharacterization of Oryza, of the Oryza rufopogon complex with the rest of the rice community. Um, really make a point to them that they're not able to be genetically differentiated into the two canonically defined um, annual and perennial species or ecotypes, either through morphological characterization or genetic differentiation, but we're seeing maybe um, clusters or subpopulations that are more geographically defined. Um, really, next, we can start to further analyze the other phenotypic screens we've done and um, see what other useful genetic variation comes out in these wilds for this range of different traits. And then, again, look at seeing how um, phenotypic variation and our subpopulation structure may correlate and how we can leverage this information to um, inform breeding purposes um, to select really gene bank resources that haven't been well characterized um, for use in evaluation and breeding programs in the future. So certainly I didn't do all of this alone. Um, I've had a huge amount of help throughout my graduate career. Um, really, I'd like to thank my committee members, especially Susan, for their help and support and advice over the years, especially um, in supporting both, I guess, the biological research uh, side along with social research um, and educational component, which is really, I think, um, really different for, from any of the other students in our department. Um, I'd like to thank a number of different Makuch Lab members, especially um, for this presentation here, Shin Jung Kim, who's worked closely with me on um, genetic analyses and differentiating um, the wild. And Juan David, whom I mentioned, um, we collaborated on to do the aluminum tolerance screen. Um, many other members, uh, both past and present, in the Makuch lab. And um, many members of Jason Meese's lab, whom we're collaborating with to do the bioinformatics and um, genome-wide analyses. Uh, groups with the USDA Dale Bumpers National Rice Research Center. Um, that's Georgia, Anna, and um, Daniel and Teresa, and also um, Ken McNally and Rory Sackville Hamilton at Erie, who have really been our collaborators in doing the phenotypic screens on um, both Rufa Pogon and on Sativa. Um, our close collaboration with the Cochin's lab, um, especially working with um, his former grad student, Randy Clark, and also Eric and John in the lab to do our aluminum tolerance and our root system architecture screens on the wilds. Um, Dr. Goh's lab in China, who really made, um, through collaborations, made our field evaluation of the wilds possible and um, a whole group of people at the Erie Training Center whose um, work I didn't get to talk about today, but they're um, in charge of the Rice Research to Production course and um, really have been sort of wonderful staff to work with and a, um, a great example 
and I'm very happy to be going back and joining their team there in the future. And also, most certainly, um, we couldn't do any of this without our funding sources. So with that, I am over time. And I will stop and take any questions.